Well, thank you for applauding. I think Ming Gao did a wonderful job with the presentation. And uh, since she's covered all the topics, I'm going to go to lunch. <laughs> um, anyway, it's really, really great to have you all here. And for, for me to have the opportunity to come back to uh, UCLA uh, was maybe 10, 15 years ago that I was here in the anthropology department talking about human origins. So uh, it's fun to be talking about medicine. So one of the questions as a clinical geneticist that I'm confronted with is that why, can, why do we do such a bad job? Uh, there are a few diseases that we understand pretty well, maple syrup, urine disease, PKU, and we can be pretty precise about the inheritance and, and uh, predictive genetics. But the vast majority of the pro clinical problems that people are concerned about, <clears throat> such as Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, macular degeneration, diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, those uh, clinical problems, we're surprisingly poor at uh, either understanding or, in fact, doing much about, and certainly have very little ability to do predictive genetics. So that's a problem because, of course, the uh, American public uh, is concerned with exactly those clinical problems. Those are the ones that the vast majority of the people here will succumb to. Um, and so it's not surprising that um, Congress and the American people are a little bit uh, unhappy with the way our biomedical uh, institutions are managing uh, the money they give us. So that raises the question, then, why can't we understand and cure the common diseases? And what are the diseases that are problematic? Well, all the neuropsychiatric diseases, uh, heart and muscle diseases, visceral diseases, the metabolic diseases, diabetes, obesity, cancer, aging, these are all clinical problems that are the most pressing and for which we have the poorest toolkit to work with. So it isn't that $4 billion, $40 billion a year is, uh, shouldn't be enough to address these problems, and it certainly isn't the case that all of you don't work really, really hard and therefore uh, should solve these problems. So what's wrong? And there was a guy named Thomas Kuhn who was a science philosopher. He's actually a physicist, but we forgive him for that. Um, science philosopher. And um, he uh, realized that what was really important in developing a scientific program was the initial idea that you had about how the world was organized. <clears throat> and he called those ideas paradigms. So where do we get these paradigms? Where we get these paradigms from people that tell us these paradigms. Um, so what are the key paradigms in Western medical thought? Well, the one paradigm is that diseases are basically anatomical. <clears throat> well, how did that come about? Well, that goes back to a man named Vesalius who lived a half a millennia ago. And he was the first to define the anatomy of the human body. And then uh, all the subsequent aspiring physicians and what we now call scientists uh, then decided to emphasize different parts of the body. So today we have ophthalmologists, neurologists, cardiologists, nephrologists, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that leads to a corollary. And the corollary is if I have a headache, then I should go see the neurologist because there must be something wrong with my head. That's the anatomical perception, perceptive of medicine, perspective of medicine. Um, but in fact, that corollary has never been formally proven. That's just an assumption. Because it's perfectly possible that you could have a systemic problem for which the brain was particularly sensitive to, and that would give you the headache, and you could study the brain all you wanted, you would still never understand the disease. The second major uh, philosophical paradigm, which Western medicine is based on, goes back to Mendel about 150 years ago. And he studied pea plants and their inheritance. And a small subset of the inheritance patterns of pea plants followed a, a pattern that we've all been taught in school, the idea that there are two gene copies for each gene. One goes into each gamete. At fertilization, they come back together. And we are all diploid. And that's wonderful. That was very, very powerful. At the turn of the 20th century, all the fruit fly Drosophila geneticists were studying the anatomy of fruit flies, and all of their genetic traits follow that pattern. And they said, Eureka, we've solved genetics problem. We now know that genes are inherited according to laws of Mendel. Well, that's uh, actually very logical because the, most of the DNA is on chromosomes, and that inheritance pattern is due to the chromosomes. However, uh, we've applied these Mendelian logic to these diseases to the tune of hundreds of billions, if not trillions, of dollars, and we still can't tell people uh, why they have the disease and what we can do about it. So there may be something wrong with that idea as well. So 
What's interesting is that all the anatomical genes are, in fact, on the chromosome. So all anatomical traits are Mendelian. So that was great for Drosophila genetesis. But now these diseases may or may not be anatomical. Just because you have a headache doesn't mean that there's something wrong with your head today that wasn't wrong or good yesterday. So that raises the question, well, what's missing? Well, life is not just about anatomy. Anatomy is, in fact, what you see in the mirror. When you go to medical school, the first thing you do is spend a whole year studying the anatomy, learning everything for the last half a millennia. But as I tell medical students, it would be great uh, if your patient leaves the office in the same state as your cadaver. The anatomy would be fine. The only problem is the patient would be dead, and that probably wouldn't be good for your reputation. So the question is, why was the patient dead? Not the anatomy was wrong. Something was missing. What was missing was energy. Newton said a half a millennia ago, mass doesn't move without energy. And you're the most animated thing in my environment. So therefore, being animated and being mass, energy must be critical. So why isn't half of medicine about energy? And yet, as far as I know, in most medical schools, you memorize the TCA cycle, go to sleep, and forget about it. OK, <clears throat> so if life is about having anatomy to have structure and energy to be animated, then you need information about anatomy, anatomy and information about energy. Well, if that's true then, maybe if we think about energy, maybe a lot of these diseases might be about energy. So our basic idea is that, in fact, energy uh, deficiency is, a, is, the re, is the basis of all the common complex diseases. And interestingly enough, the most important information about energy is not on the chromosomes. So therefore, it does not mendelize. So if that's the case, then you might come up with a new hypothesis. Our hypothesis that we've been testing for the last 45 years is bioenergetic dysfunction lies at the nexus of genetic and environmental causes, and that the common complex diseases are bioenergetic diseases, not anatomical diseases. So this is your biochemistry lesson from hell. I've never met a medical student that liked this, and I love it, and I like torturing medical students, so we go through this. OK, so this is a symbiotic bacteria. Sitting in your chair right now are 10 to the 17th, 10 to the 12th living individuals. Those are called cells. And each one of them has an independent life. We can take a little blood, uh, sample of your skin, put it in culture. Cells will grow perfectly fine. You can go out and get run over by a truck. Your cells don't care. They're growing perfectly fine. So you are a colony of cells. The idea of an I is purely an illusion. You're a they. OK, or a we, let's say. But inside each of the we, there's another colony of cells. And that colony of bacteria, the they, is in fact the most common cell in your body. There are 10 to the 17th of these bacteria sitting in your chair right now, in the order of 30% of your weight. And those bacteria are called the mitochondria. So they entered the cell about 2.5 billion years ago. And this was the outer uh, phagocytic vesicle, if you will. And this is the original bacterial membrane. So the, this is just one of those bacteria. So this is the outer mitochondrial membrane, intermembrane space, inner mitochondrial membrane, and the mitochondrial matrix. So this is, of course, as you've been told, the power plant of the cell, which is wholly simplistic. But you take um, carbohydrates and fats from your environment. You strip the hydrogens off those uh, carbohydrates and fats and react it with the oxygen that you're breathing. And you burn that to give water and generate energy. And if you don't think this lecture is important, just stop breathing for the next 10 minutes and you can go. <laughs> OK. So let's say we're talking about glucose. Well, it goes through glycolysis to make pyruvate. Pyruvate can be reduced to lactate, or it can get an amino group to give you alanine if there's a big block in the mitochondrial function. Pyruvate goes through pyruvate dehydrogenase, which will generate acetyl-CoA, driving the tricarboxylic acid cycle, the purpose of which is not to anesthetize medical students, but to put hydrogen on this carrier, NAD. So here is the oxidized and the reduced form with the two hydrogens. Now, uh, NADH is oxidized by NADH dehydrogenase, or complex 1. The electrons flow through complex 1, CoQ, complex 3, cytochrome C, com uh, cytochrome C oxidase, or complex 4, and reduce an atom of oxygen to give you a molecule of water. Now, if all you were doing was burning electrons, we'd just generate a lot of heat, and you would, of course, melt down. That wouldn't be good. So how do we get that energy to use it 
in a way that we want to use it for different purposes. Well, as the electrons flow through complex 1, 3, and 4, they use that energy to pump protons from the mitochondrial matrix through the lipid bilayer, which is an insulator, into the intermembrane space. And as Peter Mitchell hypothesized, then that energy is based on an electrochemical gradient that's positive and acid on the outside and alkaline and negative on the inside. And then he proposed that, that potential energy was used by the ATP synthase, for which one of your uh, faculty members got, won the Nobel Prize, because as the protons move through the system, a spinning wheel causes rotation, which then causes binding of ADP and phosphate to condense ATP. And then the ATP goes out through the adenine nucleotide translocator, out through a sieve-like protein, the voltage-dependent anion channel. Their ATP is hydrolyzed to uh, make ADP to do work. So you've coupled phosphorylation with oxidation, oxidative phosphorylation. Now, everybody in this room has a slightly different efficiency at pumping protons out versus calories burned and converting them to ATP. We call that coupling efficiency. Now, a calorie is a unit of heat. Every calorie that you burn generates that amount of heat inside your body. So, in fact, if you're very efficient at pumping protons out and converting them to ATP, then you'll have to burn the minimum number of hydrogen calories uh, to make the maximum amount of ATP, and as a result, you'll generate the, the minimum amount of core body heat. However, if you're less efficient at pumping protons out or converting them to ATP, then you're going to have to burn more calories for the same amount of work, and that's going to generate more heat. So your body then is monitoring your um, body temperature at 37 degrees centigrade versus your workload based on the coupling efficiency. Okay. Now, it's a furnace, so it's going to have incomplete uh, combustion. So electrons can go directly to O2 to give you an unpaired electron in the outer orbi orbital, superoxid anion. Manganese SOD will take two of these to make hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide could get another electron by a reduced transition metal to give you a hydroxyl radical. And these are the reactive oxygen species, or the oxygen radicals. So if you take vitamin E or vitamin C or beta carotene, uh, or coenzyme Q, you, you are concerned that you are getting oxidative damage from these oxygen radicals. Now, your cells have an enzyme, nicotinamide nucleoside tri, uh, transhydrogenase, that makes NADPH, and glutathione peroxidase that uses that NADPH to reduce hydrogen peroxide to water, and that then uh, detoxifies the hydrogen peroxide. But this is a rate-limiting step, so there's an excess of this. The mitochondria also being a capacitor, it's negatively charged inside. It has the capacity to take up calcium, and it's the major calcium regulator in your cells. And that's important because calcium is the most important inorganic molecule or atom uh, in regulating a lot of uh, biochemical processes. And finally, it has a self-destruct system, the structure of which is actively debate. But normally, it's a closed door. But when the energy potential declines, oxidative stress gets high, calcium overload becomes excessive, impinge on this pore, it goes from a closed door to an open channel. The open channel short circuits the membrane potential, fluids flow in, the inner membrane swells, backs and back form a mega channel. They release all these stored um, intermembrane proteins, including cytochrome C. They go out and they drive apoptosis and degrade the cell from inside out. So the mitochondria has lots of different functions. It regulates the energy. It uh, regulates the redox balance, and about two-thirds uh, two of all the proteins are thiodisulfide uh, regulated. Uh, it regulates reactive oxygen species, which are signaling molecules at low level, are damaging at high levels, regulates calcium, regulates apoptosis, and all these TCA cycle intermediates directly are the intermediates for all the enzymes that regulate the signal transduction system and the epigenome of the nucleus. Because why? The nucleus can't do anything without enough energy. It has to know what the mitochondrial energetic state is, and therefore it uses mitochondrial metabolism to assess that. So your cell is two life forms, a nuclear cytosolic life form, which was originally a methionogen of the, methionogen of the uh, archaeobacterial form. It has uh, DNA and chromosomes transcribed in RNA, translated onto cytosolic ribosomes. And between 1 and 2,000 anatomical proteins of the nucleus go into the mitochondria to assemble the mitochondrial structure. But the mitochondrial genome, which originally was co-equal with this genome, besides transferring all the anatomical genes to the nucleus, it's retained 13 polypeptides, 22 transfer RNAs, and a small and large ribosomal RNA. And those uh, transfer RNAs and ribosomal RNAs make mitochondrial-specific ribosomes. 
Mitochondrial translation is initiated by n formal methionine, just like bacterial ribosomes. These ribosomes are sensitive to chloramphenicol and aminoglycosides, just like bacteria are, and it codes for 13 polypeptides. So what are those? There's seven of the 45 proteins of complex one, one of the 11 proteins of complex three, three of the 13 proteins of complex four, and two of the 17 proteins of complex five. Well, if you're going to put 2,000 genes in the nucleus, why keep 13? The answer, I believe, is because those are the electron and proton carriers for these four enzymes. And what do these four enzymes share? They share the membrane potential. Now, this membrane potential is a capacitor. If one of these became leaky for protons, it would short the circuit and you would be dead. So Mother Nature was very concerned about that. She said, well, how am I going to balance the evolution of all of these enzymes so that they stay together? And so she had a great idea. Being a woman, she decided that the mitochondrial circuit diagram would be inherited only from women. And so therefore, um, the mitochondrial DNA is transmitted from mother to all of her children and her daughters to their children. Males' mitochondria enter the egg, are seen as foreign, and are destroyed. So men have been thrown out for two billion years. Don't feel bad about it, guys. <laughs> okay. So the point of that is that this circuit diagram, uh, the wiring diagram of the power plant, can only change by sequential mutation because it cannot recombine. It never mixes two mitochondrial lineages. And why would that be? That means that any new mutation on one of the genes is tested against all the other genes of that same circuit diagram to make sure that it's compatible. And if it's not, that individual dies. So it's just like any other power plant around uh, Los Angeles. The building of the power plants with the city managers, but the wiring diagram of every power plant is unique, and you would never think of mixing the wiring diagram half from one power plant and half from another. That would be disastrous. So the same is true for your mitochondrial DNA. Now, each cell has hundreds to thousands of these mitochondrial DNAs, and they're constantly replicating inside your cells right now. And if you doubt that they're active and vital in there, uh, talking to each other, tonight when it's very, very quiet and your spouse is not snoring, if you just concentrate, you'll feel them wiggling in there. Uh, anyway, they're constantly replicating, and as a replicating DNA, they accumulate damage or mutations. And that creates then inside the cell a mixture of mutant and normal. They're called heteroplasmic. So if the cell divided down the middle, then both daughter cells would get some mutant and some normal. But if it divided this way, then this cell would have only normal, and this would have twice as many mutant mitochondrial DNAs. So over multiple cell divisions, the heteroplasmic cell will segregate out to give you tissues within the same individual with different genotypes, some of which have good mitochondrial DNAs and high energy, some with bad mitochondrial DNAs and low energy. And if it's below the minimum energy for that tissue, then you will get a phenotype, a equivalent of a biological um, a metropolitan brownout. So if there was a line voltage decline in LA, all the electrical systems wouldn't fail at one time. The first thing that would go would be the fluorescent light bulbs, then certain elevators, then certain electron motor, electrical motors, but the incandescent light bulbs would just get dimmer and dimmer. Well, the same is true for your body. Different parts of your body rely on energy to different extents. So as the energy declines, you're going to get organ-specific symptoms of a systemic defect. Now, the mitochondrial DNA has a very high mutation rate, and that's really a, a neat story, but we won't go into that. Just accept that it does. And there are three classes of mutations that I want to talk about. One are mutations that occur in the female maternal lineage, and they will give you then maternally inherited disease. And so this is a mutation in the 12S ribosomal RNA. By the way, this is 12, the two ribosomal RNAs, ND1, 2, 3, 4, L4, 5, and 6, are the genes for complex one. This is the gene for complex three. CO1, 2, and 3 for complex 4, and ATPA 6 and 8 for complex 5. So a mutation in the 12S ribosomal RNA at a nucleotide position 1555, if you inherit that from your mother, you're fine until midlife, and then you'll lose your hearing, sensory neural hearing loss. But if you get treated by aminoglycoside antibiotics, you'll go death within a week. Okay? Mutation in the tRNA leucine gene and other protein synthesis mutation at 3243. At 30% mutant will give you diabetes. 50% mutant gives you neuromuscular disease. 100% mutant, you're dead. Mutation in the tRNA glutamine gene at 4336 predispose you to late Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Mutation in the tRNA lysine gene predisposes you to kinds of epilepsy. There are 300 protein synthesis mitochondrial DNA mutations that cause disease. 
There are also many missense mutations. Mutation in the ND4 gene at 11778, that predisposes you to a very interesting disease. You're fine until midlife, then you'll lose vision in one eye, and then in the other. Labor's hereditary optic neuropathy. Mutation in the ND6 gene at 14484, same disease. Mutation in the ND6 gene at 14459, more severe, when it's heteroplasmic, gives you optic atrophy, when it's homoplasmic, gives you childhood generalized dystonia, kind of movement disorder. Mutation in the ATPA6 uh, gene at 8993, at 70% mutant gives you retinitis pigmentosa, 85% gives you olivopontus cerebellar atrophy, 90% your kid dead as a child. So we have a quantitative genetics with totally different clinical phenotypes. We also have a whole mess of cancer mutations, but I won't be going into that today. So these are then mutations that occur in the maternal lineage. They're relatively recent, and they give maternal predisposition to disease. But we have also ancient variants, like this variant at ND1. That is found in 3 quarters of all sub-Saharan Africans, and we call that macrohaplogroup L. Variant H is found in half of Europeans. Variant A, B, C, and D arose in Central Asia. They crossed the Bering Land Bridge and colonized the Americas. Why are these regionally specific lineages? Because those are the variants that allowed our ancestors to change their coupling efficiency and adapt to different environments as they migrate around the world. And finally, we're accumulating damage to our mitochondrial DNA. Those are called somatic mutations. They're often found in this regulatory region. And of course, then there are nuclear mutations as well. So why would there be tissue-specific symptomatology? Well, because different tissues rely on uh, mitochondrial energy for different extents. So the brain is 2% of your body weight, but uses 20% of the mitochondrial energy. So a 5% reduction in mitochondrial energy is preferentially going to give you a very bad headache. Uh, heart, muscle, renal, they're also high energy tissues. Uh, there are energy storage tissues. They store fatty acids because the mitochondria burns fatty acids. So white adipose tissue stores fat to make ATP. Brown adipose tissue stores fat to make heat. There's a uh, energy homeostasis tissue. That's the liver. It regulates glucose. Well, why would it do that? Because plants take sunlight and make glucose. So that's your connection with, with sunlight. So you have to know the flow of energy through your liver. And then we have energy sensing tissue. The pancreatic beta cells sense high glucose, send out insulin, and say, use glycolysis because we've got a lot of carbohydrates. Or when you're fasting, the glucose level is limiting. The alpha cells send out glucagon. They mobilize fatty acids, turn on oxidative phosphorylation to burn the fat to get you through a period of starvation. So in fact, when you think energetically, much of anatomy is about energetics, not about anatomy. So this is the take-home lesson. And for those of you that are really tired of this already, we can all leave. Um, but this shows then how the world looks if you get anatomy out of the metal of medicine and you put in bioenergetics. So here's bioenergetics, mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, it regulates energy, ROS, uh, reactive oxygen species, redox, calcium, et cetera. It can be modulated by mutations in nuclear genes or by changes in their expression through the epigenome. Uh, it can be changed by mitochondrial variants that are ancient adaptive polymorphisms or recent deleterious mutations. It's affected by whether you eat pizza or whether you eat fish or any other dietary effects. It's affected by whether you exercise, your reproductive challenges, or whether you smoke, which is a very severe mitochondrial toxin. If you inhibit mitochondrial function, there's not enough energy. Replication begins to become errors in the mitochondrial DNA, because it's replicated inside the mitochondria. That will give you an age-related decline in mitochondrial function, because you're blowing up the power plant uh, circuit diagrams. And we believe that's what aging and then the delayed onset and progressive course of common diseases are. If you have a partial defect in oxidative phosphorylation, it's going to first affect your brain. That's the neuropsychiatric symptoms. But then the heart, the muscle, and the renal. If you have a furnace, and you block the furnace, but you keep putting in fuel, carbohydrates and fats, they're going to build up in your bloodstream. And that's metabolic syndrome. If, the, in fact, the cells are sick, they cannot undergo apoptosis, then the mitochondria are released into the bloodstream, and they are perfectly good bacteria, and you're going to get inflammation. And that's why we believe all of these diseases have an inflammatory component. And finally, of course, cancer is regulating glycolysis versus oxphos to have enough energy to grow. Okay. So that's basically the idea. What's the data? 
So this is a family we studied in the early 1980s. This woman had lactic acidosis and growth retardation. These were the people we could examine. Um, they all had lactic acidosis, growth retardation, progressive dementia, stroke-like episodes, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, cardiac conduction defects, the oxidative muscle fibers, uh, type 1 fibers degenerated with these abnormal mitochondria called ragged red fibers or mitochondrial myopathy, whereas the glycolytic fibers were perfectly fine. All of these young men and women died of either status epilepticus or cardiac dysrhythmia in their late teens or early 20s. Um, this mutation was in the tRNA leucine gene at 3243, an A to G transition. The family had about 70% mutant, and that gave myopathy, cardiomyopathy, and stroke-like episodes, so-called Milos syndrome. However, this exact same mutation, when a 10 to 30% mutant, will either give you type 1 or type 2 diabetes or autism. And when at 100% mutant, will give you Lee syndrome and perinatal lethality, lethal childhood disease. So exactly the same mutation gives totally different phenotypes. The question then is why? So what we did is we took cells, we removed their, their mitochondria but kept the nucleus, and then we put in the mutant mitochondria of the patient. So we now have cell lines with normal mitochondria today, mutant mitochondria, and all different levels of heteroplasmy. So now we can then look at the effect of the heteroplasmy on nuclear gene expression. So we're using RNA-seq to look at all this array of uh, cell lines. And this is very interesting. This is a variant histone. In the 20 to 30 percent range, which is diabetes and autism, it goes way up. Then in neuromuscular disease, it's down. And then lethal childhood disease, it goes up. These are all the G-coupled receptors up during diabetes and, uh, neuro, um, diabetes and metabolic syndrome, completely turned off in the neurological diseases. These are all the genes that are involved in controlling methylation of the nuclear genome. So they're down in diabetes and um, um, metabolic syndrome, up in neuromuscular disease, down in lethal childhood disease. Uh, MEX-CP2 is Rett syndrome, down, up, down. This is a, a very important gene uh, in uh, uh, a copy number variant in autism, down, up, down. So basically you're finding this pattern over and over again in a wide variety of the genes. So if you now plot by principal component analysis all the transcripts, um, what you find is that this is the transcriptional profile with only normal mitochondrial dates. This is the profile with 20 to 30 mutant mitochondrial dates. This is the profile with 50 to 90 percent mutant mitochondrial dates. And this is a profile with 100 percent mutant, and that's no mitochondrial DNA at all. So what does this tell you? It tells you that there are specific nuclear phases that can respond to the continual change in mitochondrial genotype. And the phenotype, then, is determined by the switch from this to this, this to this, and this to this. So in fact, these transitions are very fine. There are periods of stasis, then you get to high enough alteration, and then you switch to the new transcriptional state, and now you have a new phenotype. OK. So we have nuclear cytoplasmic interaction is critical to understanding the pathology. So this is a family that had a mutation in the ND6 gene. Uh, it changes a proline and codon 25 to leucine, very highly conserved proline. This woman in her blood had 50% mutant. She had optic atrophy and cerebellar ataxia. This is her sister, had only 5%. Uh, mutant in her blood and was perfectly normal. She had three different consorts. Every one of her children had 100% mutant, and they all died. So this shows how rapidly mitochondrial stochastic segregation can occur in the germline and in tissues. So we wanted to prove that this mutation was, in fact, the cause of the disease, so we made a mouse. So what we do is we take culture and mouse cells, we mutagenize the mitochondrial DNA, and then select for mutants that we want to study. So we have an ND6 mutation, proline 25 to leucine. We're looking at a CO1 mutation, valine 421 to alanine. And we just mix two normal mitochondrial DNA. So how do we do this? We take the cell, we remove the nucleus, take the cytoplasmic fragment. We made a female embryonic stem cell from a 129 mouse. We then cure it of its resident mitochondria with drug rhodamine 6G. We substitute in the mutant mitochondria into a pluripotent cybrid, cytoplasmic hybrid, put the cybrid into a blastocyst, put it in a foster mother, get chimeric animals, and breed the females to bring up the dominant agouti locus, thus picking up the mitochondrial DNA. Okay. So this is the work um, that we collaborated with um, 
Alfredo Sedun and Valerio Corelli, and I'll get back to them, of course, a little bit later. But this is their wonderful data. This is the uh, optic nerve of a normal mouse. This is the optic nerve of the mutant mouse. You can see that the axons are swollen. We see demyelination. And by the way, labors is, in females is often associated with a, a multiple sclerosis-like phenotype. Uh, we see a preferential loss of the larger caliber fibers, um, which is very similar to what we see in labors. And then what we can do is isolate the brain synaptosomes and study their biochemistry. So when we do that, and this, by the way, uh, is the work of uh, Mark Sharpley, who's uh, here now at UCLA. If we look at the synaptosome biochemistry, we didn't find much change at ATP. The, the biochemical defect is about a 30% reduction in respiration, but as Mark put on more stress for energy onto the uh, synaptosomes, respiration would go up toward near normal. But what happened is there was a massive increase in reactive oxygen species production. So this mutation redirects the electrons into making ROS, and they, we think this is a primarily a ROS toxicity disease. And we're doing a lot more with this, but that's that story. Now, we're going to look at CO1 mutation, valine 421 to alanine. There's 50% reduction in mitochondrial complex 4 throughout the body. We get ragged red fibers, like in the family. Uh, we get a cardiomyopathy with fibrosis and abnormal mitochondria. And if we age these mice, they then get type 2 diabetes. So this is uh, their inability to manage glucose, and they're highly insulin resistant. What's interesting is that the ND6 mutation, which is neurological, does not have that phenotype. So just changing mitochondria at different levels can have radically effect, different effects on phenotype. So now what we did is we took two perfectly normal mitochondrial DNAs, and again, this is important work that Mark did. We have an NZB uh, mouse and a 129 mouse, and we simply mix those two normal mitochondrial DNAs. They differ by 15 amino acid changes and some ribosomal RNA changes. We made sure that the nucleuses were absolutely normal, and then we looked at the uh, mitochondrial genotype. So this is NZB, and that's a 129. So this is the founder female, and she's heteroplasmic. This is her daughter, she's heteroplasmic. The daughter then had all of these offspring, and from this male, these offspring as granddaughters, and they're all heteroplasmic, so maternal transmission. Whereas the males with the female, there's no transmission. So this heteroplasmy is maternally inherited, not a big surprise. But now what we did is we took those heteroplasmic animals, and over a number of years, we've segregated out uh, on one lineage the NZB to give you 129, and on another lineage the 129 to give you NZB. So now we've kept the same nucleus, but we've now just gone back to one or the other mitochondria. And we then kept heteroplasmic animals. So then with um, Sassoni Corsi, uh, while I was UCI, we asked what um, did this do to the activity of these animals. So these are activity grams. Mice are active at night. And you can see this is night, day, night. 129 is active at night. NZB are active at night. But the heteroplasmic animals are hypoactive. They're depressed, if you will. We then did a, um, a learning and memory study. This is a Barnes maze. We had different color uh, papers around here so the mice could orient. There are all these holes, but only one of them has a little black box under it. And the mouse wants to hide because there's a bright light on the uh, Barnes maze surface. So it searches around until it finds the hole and jumps in. So um, Megan McManus then did a series of studies on the uh, NZB mitochondrial DNA, the 129 mitochondrial DNA animals. And over each successive time, they learned where the hole is and they jumped in. The heteroplasmic animal also learned by daily changes. But then she waited two days and repeated the experiment. The 129 animals immediately went and jumped in the hole. The NZB animals went and jumped in the hole. But the heteroplasmic animals had completely forgotten everything they learned. They had no long-term memory. So simply mixing two perfectly normal mitochondrial DNAs wiped out long-term memory. So this variant then was enough to give you neuropsychiatric disorders and memory loss and had no mutation at all, just changed maternal inheritance. Okay, so this is a family that uh, had this sudden onset blindness. Um, the males are affected. They went blind through this female, and through this female, all the blind people are affected. But there are also people that are not affected. So this particular disease has variable penetrance, uh, with males being four times more likely to go blind than females. So there's a lot of interesting biology in that. But one of the things that's interesting is that different pedigrees have different degrees of this penetrance. So um, this mutation is an ND4-11778G to H transition 
arginine codon 340 to histidine. So families uh, that have mutations that cause this kind of blindness can have mutations in multiple different uh, nucleotides. The most severe is the 3460 in the ND1 gene. The next mildest is 11778 in the ND4 gene, and the mildest is 14484 in the ND6 gene. Yet they all go blind the same way. So why is it that this more severe mutation gives the same phenotype as this mild mutation? Well, as it turns out, um, that what's important is the background of the mitochondrial DNA on which the mutation occurred. So this lineage J, and we'll come back to that, is found in 10% of the people in this room, and it doesn't matter if you're J or not. If you have this mutation, you'll have a good probability of going blind. But if you're 11778, then about a third of all the people that go blind are also J. And if you're the 14484, three quarters of all the people that go blind are also J. If you don't have J, you might have this mutation, 3394T uh, to C, and that then augments these mutations. So the milder mutations have to have a second effect, a second mit background mitochondrial effect. This 3394 changes tyrosine codon 30 to histidine in the ND1 gene. Okay. So what is J? So if we sequenced any two people in this audience, the number of nucleotide differences between the two of you would be the time since you shared a common mother, because the only way you can change is by sequential mutations along radiating maternal lineages. So what we did is went around the world, did aboriginal populations, sequenced their mitochondrial DNAs. That told us the genetic relationship of all the people, and then their geographic area told us where they were at the time. So the original mitochondrial DNAs are in the Khoisan people of the Kalahari. That's L0. L1 and L2 are two different pygmy lineages. L3 are sub-Saharan Africans. And in uh, Ethiopia, two lineages arose, N and M. And only these two mitochondrial DNAs left Africa and colonized the rest of the world. N went into the temperate zone and gave rise to a whole series of European lineages, I, J, T, U, U, K, V, I, W, X. It also went into temperate um, Asia whereas M stayed in the tropics all the way down to Australia, and then much later acquired new mutations that moved up into Central Asia to give C and D. And then finally, about 40,000 years ago, C DNA became enriched in northeastern Siberia. 20,000 years ago, the Bering Land Bridge appeared, and they crossed over and colonized the Americas. So why is that shocking? Because nuclear genetic variation is panmictic. Every allele is found in every population, but at different frequencies. Mitochondrial DNA is highly geographically confined based on your geographic origin of your ancestors. So why would that be? If you have uh, a woman, and you live in sub-Saharan Africa, and you want to reproduce, you need to be able to run away from lions. Running away from lions means you have to have the maximum amount of ATP for the minimum amount of calories, plus the fact you don't want to be hot because it's already hot. So you have to have tightly coupled mitochondria. But up here, the lions froze to death. That's not a problem. The problem is you, woman, are going to freeze to death. So how did you avoid freezing to death? You got mutations in your mitochondrial DNA that decreased their efficiency. Now you're burning more calories for the same amount of ATP, and you're generating more heat, and that makes you cold resistant. So we believe that this geographic separation of the mitochondria is because that's how our ancestors adapt to different environments. Okay? So out of Africa then, M stayed in the tropics, and these are synonymous mutations, so there was no functional change. But N went into the temperate zone, and it had these two classic missense mutations, at ND3 and ATPA6. And what do they do? They reduce the membrane potential, and they altered calcium regulation. And that would partially uncouple oxidative phosphorylation and make them more cold resistant. Oops. And that probably wasn't very good. OK, so this is a small port of, portion of the European lineage of mitochondrial DNA. But every time there's a new branch in the tree, it's founded by a highly functionally significant mitochondrial nucleotide change. So let's just look at J1 and J2. This is a mutation in cytochrome B at 14798. This is a cytochrome B mutation at 15257. 14798 is conserved all the way to C. elegans and affects the CoQ binding site. 15257 is even conserved in E. coli, affects the CoQ binding site. So here is a highly conserved amino acid that's polymorphic in the people in this room. That defies everything you've been taught about evolutionary biology. The more conserved it is across species, the less likely it should be polymorphic inside a species. But the opposite is true for the mitochondria. 
Highly conserved amino acids are polymorphic within populations. Why is that? Because they're adapting energetics to different environmental changes. And those are adaptive changes within a species. So this is a mutation that occurred about 10,000 years ago in the TRMA glutamine gene, changed this A to G. Um, and this mutation is about 0.4% in all the population. There's a couple of people around here have that. But it's found in 3% of Alzheimer's, 5% of Parkinson's, and 6.8% in Alzheimer's Parkinson's. So this is a variant that's probably beneficial early in life, maybe increases ROS production for antibacterial uh, infection, but becomes deleterious late in life because of the oxidative stress. You can get a mutation also in an ND1 gene at 3397, methionine 31 to valine, and when that arises, de novo, that will give you um, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Okay, so now we will look at high altitude. This is a study we did in Tibet where we sequenced Tibetan mitochondrial DNAs. We start with L3 out of Africa, and this is M and N. Few Ns, mostly Ms, but what we found is this 3394 mutation appearing over and over again. If we look at the altitude of the Tibetan population and the frequency of the mutation, it goes up, and the odds ratio is 25 to 27. This is adaptive for altitude. <clears throat> this is one lineage that was founded by the variant. It also goes up with altitude. So this variant, then, obviously is beneficial at high altitude. But wait a minute, that's the same tyrosine 30 to histidine variant that we said augmented the Labor's mutations. So how could it be good in high altitude and bad at low altitude? So what we did is we took uh, blood platelets that have mitochondria, we fused it into a cell that had no mitochondria, selected for the cytoplasmic hybrid cybrids, so now we have the same nucleus but different mitochondrial lineages. So these are M lineages, this is M lineage. So now what we can see is the 3394T to C does in fact cause a complex 1 defect, just as you would expect. But look at F versus B. Here is the 3394T, and it's almost the same as the 3394C. And that shows you then that the other variation in the mitochondrial DNA is as least important to the biochemistry as any one nucleotide change. So one of the problems is that nuclear geneticists want to take mitochondrial DNA sequence, take a single polymorphism, look across a whole bunch of populations, and ask, does it correlate with a disease? Well, they didn't take into context the, the fact that the context matters. If you put that mutation in a uh, M lineage that doesn't have the ND3 and the ATPA6 mutation, now that 3394C is quite good, actually. And we believe that this modest um, cytochrome complex 1 defect may in fact be beneficial at high altitude. So this is really, really complicated, but it makes a point. Out of Africa, L, N, M, with these missense mutations for M but not N, then the TRD glutamine to give you the lineage that's predisposed to Alzheimer's. This lineage then can get either the tyrosine codon 30 to histidine and be predisposed to mild diseases, labors, diabetes, but it can get the more severe mutation and give you very severe disease. Over here, however, these mutations are not augmenting this one. So this now exists in isolation, and there it has a modest effect on complex one, and that is altitude adaptive. So the context is as important as a single nucleotide change. Now, a lot of studies have been done on nuclear, I mean, on mitochondrial lineages, and they correlate with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, migraine, psychiatric disorder, stroke, cardiovascular disease, all kinds of inflammatory disease, aging, cancer, athletic performance, et cetera. So we think then mitochondrial variants is much more important than nuclear variants. Okay, so now let's talk about the nucleus. So this is a mutation in the gene, the adenine nucleotide translocator isoform 1. This is found in heart and muscle and a little bit in brain. There are multiple isoforms, so you can mutate ANT1 but not die because you have ANT2. It turns out that this is a frame shift mutation that occurred on chromosome 4 about 500 years ago in Switzerland. And these people moved to, the, to uh, North America, and these people in, uh, in, in the, Illinois got together with these people in Pennsylvania, and that was very unfortunate because they were heterozygous for their successive mutation, and then uh, that gave rise to homozygous individuals who then got cardiomyopathy. So if we then take 
um, skin cells from these patients and use, uh, convert them to iPS cells and convert them into cardiomyocytes. We can then look at the uh, cardiac uh, effects. This is looking at calcium regulation. And what you can see is the normal uh, individuals have very precise heartbeats, whereas the ANT mutants are highly dysrhythmic. Now, the other interesting thing is that the people in blue had only mild dilated cardiomyopathy, but the people in red have fulminated lethal, uh, had only mild hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. People in red had lethal dilated cardiomyopathy requiring heart transplant. So what's the difference? Well, it turns out the people with the mild cardiomyopathy have lineage H, and the people with severe cardiomyopathy have lineage U. So H and U are perfectly normal for people in this room. But if you have then also a nuclear defect, then these amplify the effect significantly. So we made a mouse. So we have a mouse. This is the mouse sizer. We put the mouse there, and it runs on the treadmill. And we measure the CO2 it gives off of the oxygen it consumes. And a normal mouse will start running. This is all at night, of course. And the experimental will collapse. But the mutant animal will start running and literally fall down. It cannot stand up. And it has a progressive amplification of mitochondria. This is cytochrome oxidase, succinate dehydrogenase, a large proliferation of mitochondria, and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. If we do echocardiography on these mice, this is the wild-type mouse, very consistent heartbeats, even with the velocity vector imaging, whereas the mutants are highly dysrhythmic, just as we found in the patients. So now what we can do is take the ANT, with its hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and now cross it with the mild ND6 or CO1 mutation. And when we cross ANT with CO1, it doesn't make that much difference. There, there's this and this. These are different cardiac outputs. But if we chain, combine ND6 with ANT, it's markedly different. And it reduces the lifespan by 50%. So this is the equivalent of N being like U and H being like um, U and CO, ND6 being like U and CO1 being like H. So the mitochondrial DNA, again, can directly modulate the expressivity of nuclear genes. So we can now take this ANT mouse and we can feed it with a high fat diet. So a normal mouse on a high fat diet will poison itself and, and begin to die. But the ANT mice proved to be hyper resistant to high fat diet. If you peel off their skin, it's very embarrassing, but you can see that they have, in fact, a high red level. Why is that? Because they have a massive proliferation of mitochondria. And what's interesting is that these mitochondria are damaged, they're uncoupled, so the respiration rate is higher. So what does that mean? That means that these mice have higher respiration rather than lower. And what did that do? That makes them highly resistant to high glucose challenge and totally insulin sensitive. So they are now the converse high mitochondria function, low sensitivity to diabetes, low mitochondrial function, high sensitivity to diabetes. This is the exception that proves the rule. OK, well, what about behavior? Uh, we talked about the brain. So here are different mouse strains. This is the NNT antioxidant enzyme. And what we, do, what we did, and this is Martin Picard and Megan McManus, they took a, just a tube and put the mouse in for 30 minutes. That gives a little bit of stress. That's about equivalent to my thinking about writing an NIH grant, even before I started. Okay. So they put them in for 30 minutes and then take them out. And then they look at different properties. So remember, the ND6 mutation is complex 1, CO1 is complex 4, the adenine nucleotide translocator exchanges the ATP, and the NNT is the antioxidant enzyme. Okay. So now we're going to look at corticosterone, our steroid hormones. So here is when they're confined, and this is when we've released them. And we can see that the ND6 responds more str strongly with the stress hormone than either the CO1 or the ND6. And if we look at glucose, the same is true. It responds more strongly. Now looking at the no nuclear genes, wild type ANT1 and the NNT, the ANT is a huge response for the stress hormone, but is completely blocked on the glucose response, whereas the NNT is completely blocked on the corticosterone, but is a huge glucose response. So subtle, none of these mice, by the way, if you looked in the cage, they all look exactly the same, as much as like you do. So these are very subtle changes. They're not, you know, don't lack an arm or something like that. OK, so there's a huge difference between whether you're ANT or NNT. If you look at just amino acids uh, in the blood, you can see that the ND6 is very different from the CO1 and the NNT and the ANT. 
So let's look at catecholamines. Dopamine goes to norepinephrine to epinephrine, flight, fight, response. So this is unstressed and stressed, unstressed and stressed with the different genotypes. So wild type, you can see that dopamine goes up as it does on the ND6, uh, the CO1, the ANT, and the NNT. But now look at norepinephrine, the next step down. The ANT animals are so stressed out that they're already maxed out on this stress hormone. That doesn't matter whether they're stressed or not. And they have actually no ability to respond to epinephrine. If we look at inf inflammation, we see that the ND6 and the antioxidant NNT have high inflammation, where the others have low inflammation. If we look at the transcription of the hippocampal genes, we see that the mitochondrial anti uh, mutant mitochondrial DNA genes have a much different transcriptional profile from ANT, NNT, or wild type. So what am I trying to say here? I'm trying to say that these mice look perfectly normal. They differ subtly by their energetics, but they have totally different personalities. And we think then that this is the variation that gives human personality differences and disorders. So what about something like epilepsy or attention deficit disorder or uh, um, autism? Well, now we have to think about the brain that has both uh, excitatory pyramidal neurons that make glutamate and inhibitory neurons that make GABA, and they interact with each other. Okay, so it turns out that the pyramidal neurons are born at the base of the developing brain, and they migrate radially, whereas the, uh, the, glutamater the GABAergic interneurons are born at the base of the brain, and they have to migrate radially, so they must go much farther. So we asked the question, developmentally, if you had a partial mitochondrial defect, would it preferentially affect this long-range migration? And the answer is yes. So this is using a very complicated way to selectively label the migrating interneurons that are gabinergic. This is a wild-type mouse, and they're all migrating along uh, the developing brain. But if you have an ANT knockout, which is a partial defect, because ANT2 is expressed here, they lose their way. They cannot find their uh, other, um, the, uh, the glu glutamatergic neurons. Now, if we use boncricic acid, which inhibits ANT, untreated, we see the neurons are migrating. Treated, they're going vertically. So then, if we, in fact, have decoupled inhibitory to excitatory neurons, then we might have overexcitation, like schizophrenia or autism. So the question is, what happens? So if we put the ANT mouse into a place where it has something to act on, marbles, it is hyper-excitable and hyper-compulsive uh, hyper about working on marbles. But if we ask it to build nests like it's going to be social, it's very deficient in that. We can see the same with the ND6 mutation. These are two different uh, wild-type mice, and these are with the ND6 mutation. They have much higher uh, this compulsive behavior. Here's the ANT of Quinn. But this is the most interesting. Here is 129 mice. This is NZB mice, homoplasmic. And this is the heteroplasmic animal. Heteroplasmy has also increased the uh, hypercompulsive behavior. So what this data sug suggests is that bioenergetic defects can have a sweeping effect on phenotypes from the very mild to the very severe. So why is that interesting? Well, it's interesting because it does say that maybe if we looked bioenergetically, we'd get a better idea about these common diseases. But it also raises a very, another very interesting idea, and that is in China, uh, there's this concept of qi, which is... if loosely translated would be vital force, and qi is related to all of these human-like phenotypes. So you can either be warm or hot, and there's a, a warm or cold, and a variety of different phenotypes. So the question is, is qi a way of monitoring the bioenergetics of people? So what we've done is we've formed an institute in China that's trying to bring together the Western structural anatomical approach with the antithesis of the Eastern vital form, and this is the symbol chi, with the idea that it's mitochondrial bioenergetics that links these two together. And that then we could then finally understand things like herbal medicines and perhaps even acupuncture. So how do we test this? Well, what we did is we, made a, we took graphene, which is a single molecule atom of uh, carbon in hexagonal rings, and this has pi orbitals that are highly fluid. So now that's a very good electrical conductor. We then 
used antibodies to link mitochondria directly to the graphene film, measured the voltage, and then we treat the mitochondria to look at what happens to the membrane potential. So if we put in an uncoupler, then in fact all the hydroxyl atoms, ions, can leak out. So the membrane potential collapses and the pH outside measured by the uh, graphene goes up. That makes sense. So uncoupling let all the hydroxyl out. But we then put in an enzyme, BIM1, and now BIM cleaves OPA1, and OPA1 is a protein that is found at the tip of the Christi. So when we did that, what happens? Well, then the matrix pH uh, went up and the outside pH went down. So that would have been completely the opposite from Mitchell's idea because all the hydroxide, all the hydrogen ions should be out here. But in fact, um, they leaked out. So instead of going in, they went out. So what does that mean? So this is our model that, in fact, the um, mitochondrial intermembrane Christi are sealed by OPA1 and this mitochondrial uh, closing complex, and that the electron transport chain makes very high concentrations of protons in these Christi lumen. That's where all the ATP synthases are bound, and they're bound along the edges where the electrostatic drive would be the greatest. So we think that this system allows for the maximum energetic capacity. When we put in um, a BIM, it cleaves OPA1 and opens these channels, and all the protons leak out, and that's why the pH dropped. What's interesting is we showed a number of years ago the adenine nucleotide translocator, when at a right voltage, can become a proton channel. Well, what would ANT be doing here if it just exchanged ATP and ADP? The ADP would go into the lumen. It would be useless. But if it's a proton channel, then it acts like the pressure cooker release valve for this very high uh, membrane potential. So this means, then, that the electrostatic potential is much higher than Pitchell, Mitchell ever imagined. And we think that that's very, very exciting and important. So then what we did is we created microfluidic channels that are 1 micron by 5 microns, and we can trap a mitochondria inside. So here are the mitochondria trapped, and we're now going to add substrates. And what you see is the mitochondria that are uh, fluorescent when they're charged light up, but what you can see is they're oscillating. And so the mitochondria, in fact, actually are undergoing uh, an oscillating field. So one possibility is that this oscillating field electrostatically is interacting with the mitochondria on an adjacent cell. So this is then looking at the heart, and here you can see what Megan McManus showed. Here's one mitochondria, here's another, and the Christi are all aligned. So if you look at this tomogram, you can see how all the Christi are aligned with each other. That means that they're interacting in a way nobody ever imagined before. So what this says is that there's a whole new bioenergetics at the level of structure and anatomy that nobody ever imagined. And we think this is the kind of thing that's being tapped into by the classic traditional Chinese medicine. So we're looking at that very strongly. So the last point to be made is we think the mitochondria then are the environmental sensors. They are regulated by nuclear encoded genes and mitochondrial DNA encoded genes. When there's a perturbation in mitochondrial bioenergetics, it sends these metabolic signals to the nucleus. Nuclear gene express expression goes back and changes the expression of the nucleus and the mitochondria to reestablish homeostasis and health. But if the environmental challenge is too great or there's a defect in nuclear or cytoplasmic mitochondrial genes, then the bioenergetic challenge cannot be corrected. We get bioenergetic decline, and that leads to decreased uh, function, disease, aging, and death. So I'd like to finish by then mentioning all the great people that have done all this work over many, many years. Um, but uh, in the bioinformatics, we have Dimitri Shaklia, who's here, and uh, Larry Singh more recently. Um, in the mouse work, we have Megan McManus, Ryan Morrow, um, Martin Picard, Mark Sharpley, um, Tal Yardini. Uh, we, the, um, the studies on induced pluripotent stem cells were Zelma Ortiz Gonzalez and Jesus. Um, our studies on the uh, bio, um, biophysics of the mitochondria with my long term collaborator Peter Burke and our graduate students. Uh, the heart studies with Jagart Narula and uh, his colleagues. Uh, the family I mentioned was from the Clinic of Special Children, Kevin Strauss, primary collaborator. 
All the eye studies were with Alfredo Sardoun and Fred Ross Sinurifs. I never could say that right. And we're out of uh, neuroscience of Bologna, Valerio Corelli and Chiara La Morag Moragia. And then epigenomic studies uh, with Paolo Sassoni Corsi and some studies with Allergan. And of course, occasionally NIH helps us, and we thank you for that. <laughs>